go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, it's Malachi, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And if you don't have a Bible, there should be one in front of you around you somewhere in the vicinity. And if you don't have a Bible, please go home with one. Uh, we would love to give you one. Let me, let me pray for us. Would you just in your seat pray the simple prayer? God, speak to me. God, help me to see you. God, help me to leave your worship. God, change me. Love you. Amen. So, um, who in here has a wedding anniversary in June? Yeah, apparently that's a, apparently that's a thing. You, you need to figure that out. You need to figure that out. Like, yes. So last year I was, I was blessed with coming off kids camp and then doing a, uh, a wedding, happy anniversary. And then, uh, and then, and then last year then, so I came off camp again and then last night I performed a, another wedding. And uh, I had this thought, I was, you know, like I go up and I, I usually give the father and the bride a hard time. And I say, uh, you know, how are you doing, Dad? You know, Amber comes up, gives a pep talk, like, on how not to cry. And um, I usually, you know, some punches thrown and stuff like that. On the way home last night at about 9, 9.30, I'm like, I have a daughter. I have a daughter. Like, what are going to be the requirements to marry my daughter? Hey, is walking on water too much to ask? I'm just, I'm asking. Ozzy, is, is that too much to ask? I, I, um, I, I really, I, I'm like scheming on some things. I was like, I got some plans, man. We're going to make this hard. I was like, I'm going to have to buy a gun. There's, just, there's, there's some things I'm just going to need to do. Uh, I mean, we're not getting younger in our house. Uh, so we're in Malachi 2, and, and, and here's what's going on. The, the Lord, in his grace and mercy, is speaking to the people of Israel through the prophet Malachi. And, and, and the people of Israel have all these complaints with God. They have all these doubts with the Lord. And they keep coming to the Lord, and they're saying, yeah, you say you love us, but not really. I don't see your love for us. And, and they keep rebutting everything that God says to them. And so we're here in this section where God is looking at their faithfulness. Right? He's looking at, literally, looking into their marriages, and he is looking into their devotion to the Lord, and how those things mingle. So, I want you to imagine that, you know, last night, as, as we're performing the ceremony, the, the bride and groom, they come up, and they say, hey, we've written our own vows. Like, oh, okay, yeah, write your own vows, that's great, that's great. I, I had a friend one time, he, he was supposed to write his own vows. He did it 30 minutes before the ceremony. He's happily married, but he was in a little bit of trouble at that time. <laughs> trying to think. They've been married 19 years, goodness. So imagine they, they step up and they're like, okay, are, are, if you're ready to make this commitment with each other and with the Lord, would you, would you present your vows? And so the groom steps forward and says, I promise to love and cherish you. And everybody in the audience says, oh. And they're looking into each other's eyes and says, I, I promise for richer, for poorer. Oh, oh. They said, but if I find somebody better, this could all change. And the audience goes, oh. And the bride pops her head. And then she says, that's in my house too. And the audience goes, huh. And, and it continues and says, well, I mean, things may get bad. And, you know, I'm not going to look better. And, you know, something may happen to you too. So we, you know, let's, let's kind of make this formal, but let's, let's have some openness with that. And as the pastor, I step in and I 
punch them both in the face. <laughs> and I say, let's go with my vows. Let's go with my vows. <coughs> we're, we're in Malachi. And Malachi chapter 2, verse 10. There's this very real issue of how marriage is being treated in Israel. Right? They, when we came off last week, they're looking at how they've mistreated the offerings of the Lord. And by mistreating the offerings of the Lord, they have despised and downgraded and really abused the name of the Lord. And so the, the next piece of this, right, if you lose the love for the Lord, right, week two, well, actually, first, week one, you lose the word of the Lord, you lose the love of the Lord. Right? You lose the love of the Lord, you lose the name of the Lord. You lose the name of the Lord. Here's what you're doing. You're, you're losing the covenants. And, and who God is and how he binds and unifies. Verse 10. Now I've got two. Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another? Profaning the covenant of our fathers. Judah has been faithless. An abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanction of the Lord, which he loves and has married the daughter of a foreign god. This is important. Right, so there's, there's a marriage piece. There's the forsaking the covenants, but then there's also marrying foreigners. This is, this is important. It's not about race. It is all about the God. See, when it says foreign God, that's, what's, that's what matters. Their degradation of them marrying, not just foreigners, it's people of other gods. It continues. May the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob any descendant of the man who does this, who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. So there, there's this intermarriage going on. There's this downplaying of marriage going on. And then, oh yeah, we're going to keep bringing our offerings. We're going to keep going to the Lord like nothing's wrong. Verse 13. And this second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor for your hand. But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. So God is completely disregarding their offering. They're, they're, they're experiencing the lack of presence of the Lord in their lives. It says, did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. First off, I would never punch a bride and groom at the altar. <laughs> Next off, there's, there's really two words for us in this brief section. Right? As they're crying out to the Lord, they're saying, God, you've stopped accepting us. There's something wrong. And God's saying, yeah, there's something wrong. God has a word for us on marriage. And God has a word for us on what I would say is syncretism. And we'll, we'll talk about what that is and how it plays into what we do in there. But first off, a word on marriage. Right? God is instructing them to be faithful in their marriage in verse 15, right? Did I not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. They had made a mess of marriage. 
And it's not just that they had made a mess of a marriage. What had happened is, within Israel, they had made a mess of all marriage. Because the problem had been such that it had just become acceptable to, to go about doing these things. And so we, we see that there's a wife of youth, and there's a despising and a rejection, a breaking of this covenant for divorce, for remarriage, for intermarriage. And, and all of it is, is just taking marriage and saying, eh. in, in, in case you don't understand, from this passage we see God loves marriage. Marriage is God's idea. Right? It is, it is, I said this last night. Marriage is not the idea of the IRS. Right? Because that is a different tax bracket and tax system. Marriage is not the idea of the government. Right? Marriage is God's idea. It is designed with blessing, it is designed with protection, it is designed with procreation. Right? God says, what do I desire? I desire godly offspring. Right? You can see what all the blessing that marriage brings. Marriage is for the glory of God. It is for the good of the couple. It is a gift and a help. Right? As, as last night. Right? They're, they're agreeing. They're saying, I'm better off with you than I am apart from you. And it goes both ways, right? That, that we're better as one in union, in covenant with the Lord, than we are separate. Marriage also brings babies, which are also for the glory of God and for the good of the family. And what we see here is that the matters of marriage on a larger scale ripple into the community. Every once in a while, there'll, there'll be statements made, very secular statements made, of things like, well, what does it matter what two people do or don't do within the confines of their home? And this has honestly been an argument that has existed for over 50 years. And God is stepping in and saying, it matters tremendously how you view and don't view marriage. How you downplay marriage, how you abuse marriage, how you mistreat marriage. This is why God said, A man shall leave his father and mother, and he will cling to and become one in flesh with his wife. And so, in God's design, right, of one man and one woman for life, in union with the Lord, it's Matters, And when we take any part of what God has said about marriage, and we just start pulling off layers of it, and we make it to be whatever we want it to be instead of what God says it is, it plays out first off into our families. Our families see it. Because you need to understand that marriage is a picture of the gospel. It is a picture of our relationship to God. It is a, and the gospel is a picture of marriage. And that God is tied into all of this on purpose, by design, for our good and for God's glory. And so, what happens is, if we're not careful, when we just kind of pull back on some of these things, what we're saying is, well, I'm going to love you if. I'm going to love you so long as this. God does not operate in these terms. God does not operate on the terms of, I'm going to love you if. I'm going to love you so long as you do this. God doesn't operate on a, you scratch my back, I scratch yours system. God operates on grace and perfect faithfulness. And so, when we start taking shots at marriage, when we start letting the secular world tell us the way the family should or shouldn't be, what we're really doing in essence is saying, God's wrong. God doesn't know what's best. 
Well, God's love ebbs and flows. God's love, I mean, and, and remember the very first question. God, how do you love us? All of these things are tied together. So we lose these pieces and we say, well, you know, what does it matter? What's the big deal? It's a big deal to God. It is a big deal to God. And so I said there's a word on marriage and then there's a word on syncretism. Syncretism. Here's what syncretism is. Yeah, I mean, the best way to look at it is it's melding of something with another thing. It's pulling in ideas and things and making it as though it's our own. Here's, here's how syncretism often played out in the Bible. Solomon is a great example of both of these problems. <coughs> Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived. First off, that's Jesus. But Solomon is seen as, as this. I mean, he, he writes the Proverbs. Surely God blessed him with wisdom. But as his life went on, what did he start doing? He started marrying, like, marrying, like, a lot of women. I'm not, let me, let me, I don't think God, like, a lot of women. And then, and if he didn't marry him, he just kind of had him on the side. And, and as he married, he's marrying all these foreign women. And so all of a sudden, all these foreign women want to worship their gods. And they're bringing idolatry in to the king, in with these marriages. And so all of a sudden, it's not about the one true God. It's about Baal. Right? It's about all of these other gods and, and, and the worship of all of them. And so Solomon, ironically, who builds the temple of the Lord, also builds places of worship for all of his lady folk. So they can worship their gods. And what's going to happen is, over time, they start to say, well, our God, Jehovah, Yahweh God, he wants to be worshipped in a like manner. And so, you know, maybe we should sacrifice our children too. Because that's the type of worship that's happening in the Old Testament. And that secrecy, that's what secretism is. It's the pulling in of other things and melding it together. And saying, oh, here's, here's secretism, here's what secretism looks like in 2022. It's okay. Everybody worships the same God. It's okay. All paths go to the same heaven. I heard a kid say, a kid at kids' camp this week say, well, my grandma told me that we all have different heavens. And I was like, your grandma was crazy. <laughs> I didn't say that. I took him aside and then I said, that. no. I, I struck him with scripture. I said, I said, I said to him, what's the treasure of heaven, buddy? Well, God's the treasure of heaven. And I said, well, how many gods are there? There's one God. Well, then if God's the treasure of heaven, then there can only be one heaven. And little man comes away going, yeah, you're right. And I said, no, the Bible's right. But you, you, you think this is, just, this is a kid in Kansas. This is what secretism looks like. Let, let, me, let me show you. So, oh, the word on marriage, verse 16, it says, For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So, guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. Secretism looks like this it looks like standing at the altar with God, saying, God, I'm going to love you. So long as you make me healthy, wealthy, and happy. God, I'm in it. So long as things are really good. And, and, and if that doesn't work out, then I'm going to try some other things. No, no, no. God wants exclusive faithfulness. 
God says, hey, there ain't no girl on the side of me. God wants faithfulness. You see, syncretism is a societal seduction. It's seen in Malachi and it's seen today. And what it does is it pulls us away from the Lord. In serving not one master, but two masters. Or three masters. Or four masters. Or five or six. Or more and more and more. And so what's happening is, is your heart is being pulled in multiple directions until no longer is it God who has every say, who has perfect allegiance, who gets the ultimate faithfulness of your life. And so what do you do? You have to start juggling these things. You're trying to make God happy. You're trying to make all these different people happy. And what it's doing is it's uncovering an abomination before the Lord. There's this scene at the end of the Chronicles of Narnia. These these, um, well-crafted books by C.S. Lewis. Written over 60 years ago, mind you. And the very last of these children's books... Aslan, all throughout the books, is not just a line, but the line. Aslan represents Jesus. We we see that. But then a a monkey comes onto the scene, and he wants to deceive the society that's seen in the setting of this last book. And so he's trying to merge the culture of Narnia with the culture of who's long been the enemy, the Chaldeans. And so they, he takes it, and he says, and, and they're fighting. And one's saying, well, we serve Aslan. And the other says, we serve Tosh. And for us, Tosh looks a lot like Islam. And Allah. And the monkey stands up, and he says, they're all the same. Don't you understand? And so all of a sudden, Aslan and Tosh get merged into something new called Toshlin. Toshlin. And the, the, the Narnians are over here going, I don't think that makes sense. And the Calamites are over here going, I don't think that makes sense either. And this plays on through about a bulk of half of the book until Aslan shows up and sets everything right. You see, I I love what C.S. Lewis is doing because he's pinpointing what's going on in his society and context. It's unfortunately still true for us today. Is is we step in as Christ followers, we say, well, yeah, I'm a Christian, but I do this too. And I I do this too. And I have some allegiance to these things, but, you know, I mean, it's not like I want to be fanatical about God. Oh, really? And we see what's going on in society. We see what's going on within other religions. We see what's going on outside of the Bible. And what happens is, is we say, well, that's good. Let's put that in too. And chances are, you're not in here making up a Toshlin of, well, you know, Allah and Jesus are the same God. And they're not. Not even close. Not even close. I think some of the ways we use syncretism in the church is the church has become incredibly pragmatic. And so we say, here's what we do. We say, well, that works and that's successful, so we should do that here too. And it it completely takes over the church. And so all of a sudden, (laughs) pragmatism is the engine that drives the church and the rails of the church instead of the Bible. And we, and we look to see, well, what does society say is good? I'll tell you what society loves, and they always love charisma, man. Charismatic leaders, charismatic speakers. People that just make you go, oh, yeah. Entertainment. You know what, you know what lights a fire in the church? The spirit of the living God. 
the spirit of the living God. And the more we become man-centered, the more we drive out and we push out the spirit of God to say, we don't need the spirit because we've got this. We've got that. And so we subtly mix in a little bit of separatism. Because that's, what the, that's the world's game. That's the game of politics. That's the game of business. That's not the game of the church. So, understand. God has never been okay with partial devotion. When he makes this statement in verse 16, he says, says the Lord, the God of Israel. It says they're covering their garments with violence. It is weird. It is hard to translate. I, I, I read multiple things, and it's like four different ideas come out of this. Here's, here's what I take from this. This covering of garments and violence. You, you think of blood-saturated garments. I saw one translation try to get it, but I was like, no. It was the picture of putting a garment over bloody garments. The picture here is that God is exposing the deeds of the people. God is exposing the deeds of the people, and it's so apparent that it's covering the outside of them. And so God's saying, what's been going on in your heart is now being revealed to everyone. Because right? it wasn't just a matter of, here's how you treat marriage. No, it started out as a matter of the heart. And the same for their devotion to the Lord. It's being uncovered, it's being displayed, it's being seen. And so, how are we instructed in the midst of this word on marriage and this word on syncretism? Because right? that's, that's when I talk about intermarriage, that's how syncretism plays into this. It says, well, you know, I got this bride. Well, I've got this girl. Man, she's an Egyptian. You know, Cleopatra, come on. And all of a sudden, they pull in the gods of Egypt. They pull in the gods of the Edomites. They pull in the gods of the Canaanites. And so that's why this intermarriage is a big deal. It's because of the, the worship of idols that's playing into this, that's bringing about a partial devotion to God, if any devotion at all. And it's downplaying the Lord. And it's degrading their marriage. It's degrading society. It's degrading Israel. It's degrading the name of the Lord God. And so, how are we instructed? We are instructed twice here at the end of this. Verse 15, guard yourselves. Verse 16, guard yourselves. Verse 15, guard your marriage, right? Let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. And then verse 16, it changes a little bit. To guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. So God is saying, you see it as just marriage. I see it as all tied together. You see it as no big deal. God says, I see it as tremendous importance. So you guard yourselves. We, we guard ourselves because over time, when we start pulling things out of Scripture, it's, it's gradual. When, when we would go hiking, my, my dad loved the outdoors, and, um, and we would go on hikes. And I remember a couple times where in the Boy Scouts, we would go on a hike in the, in the evening, and my dad wouldn't let us take a flashlight. He said, your eyes are going to adjust, your night vision is going to kick in, and so we would just, we would go through, and we would learn. And then there were other times where we would hike in the daylight, and we would stay on this path, and my dad would say, whoa, 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 whoa. He, he grew up in the mountains of New Mexico, near Albuquerque. And we would stay on the trail, we would stay on the trail, and we'd go off the trail, and my dad would say, here's why we can't do that, son. Because when you step off the trail and off the path, what's going to happen is you're creating a new path that when the rain falls, when the wind comes, it's going to wear out, and it's going to wear out the path, and, and erosion's going to happen. Erosion's going to happen. You're going to shuffle your feet, and then other people are going to shuffle their feet, and what, what's going to happen is it's not going to just get rid of the path, the good path, 
what's going to happen is it's going to get rid of the whole side of this hill. It's going to get rid of the whole side of this little bit of the mountain, this cliff, because it was very intentionally cut out. Because it would be easier sometimes, right, you go hiking up a mountain. You make switchbacks. So you're walking back and forth. Maybe a quarter of a mile, maybe. Probably more like a football field. You should go back and forth. The whole way up the mountain. The whole way up the mountain. And you go, wouldn't it be easier if we just went in a straight line? Well, not really. So what you're doing is you're, you're keeping a path and creating a path so that not just you can go, so that everybody can go. We are guarding ourselves because what happens is when we leave the path, when we leave the design that God has given us, things start to erode. It's just a couple of pebbles. Those pebbles turn into rocks, and those rocks will erode boulders. And what's going to happen is a little bit of your rain is going to fall, and it's going to wear out a lot. A lot of rain is going to fall, and whole boulders fall down the mountain. Friends, when we leave the path that God has designed for us, erosion happens, but it's an erosion of the heart. And at first, it's sand and pebbles that it's hard to see. But then over time, it says that God describes it. You're covering your garments with violence. Everybody sees it. You can't hide it anymore. That's what this is saying to us. And so what do we do? We guard ourselves. Listen. Right? There's two words. We're guarding. We're, we're, there's a word on marriage. There's a word on security. First one. We guard our marriages. We guard our marriages. We set up a circle around it. We set boundaries around it. We set limitations around it. Right? The, the bride and groom last night, they're putting their, fingers, their, their rings on each other's fingers. They're staring. And I, I, I started saying this. As you, as you do this, a ring is a sign of commitment. It's also a sign of authority. And so you're, as you're exchanging these rings, you're saying, you have authority over the other. Because it's not about me. I don't get to do whatever I want to do. We guard our marriages. Listen, it, I, I think it's important to also say, we guard our dating relationship. We, we guard engagements. We guard relationships. But we guard marriage. Why? Because marriage is God's idea. It has God's design stamped all over it from the very beginning of our Bible. Right? When, when Jesus is talking about marriage, when the Apostle Paul is sitting about marriage, he's not talking, he's not pulling up Moses, he's going all the way to Genesis. He takes it all the way back to Adam and Eve, time and time and time again. It's built into creation itself. We guard it. I tell, I tell couples that I counsel with, I said, you want to be monogamous. And they go, and they nod, and go, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, duh. I go, no, no, no. You want to be monogamous in your mind, in your thoughts. That you don't let fantasies creep in. You don't let ideas of the world creep in. So you're monogamous in your mind. You're monogamous in your heart. You're monogamous with your thoughts, with your words with the things you listen to, with your eyeballs. You guard your marriage through every bit of this. Because erosion happens. And then a landslide comes. Guard our marriages. Church, witnesses of marriages, it's all on. We all play a part in this. Right? God is, God is highlighting what happens in the union. Right? He's saying, listen, I'm in on making the union happen. It's so interesting. He says, I I'm making you one with portions of spirit. So I say, what? Yeah. And it's God who is joining together. And, and, and we see, what God joins together, let no man separate. This is important. We guard. And there's a word on series. We guard our time. We guard it. We guard the idle moments. 
We guard the busy moments. Why do I say we guard our time? Because that's how syncretism comes in. How do you find what you're devoted to? How do you find what you're faithful to? You look at how you spend your time, period. And so you guard it. You guard it. In, in, in simple ways and in bigger ways. Because what happens is, all of a sudden, those areas where we say, well, well God gets this, what we start doing is we start giving God the leftovers like we saw last week. We guard our time. We guard our influences. You are being influenced all the time. There is something fighting for all of your thoughts, for all of your heart, all the time, every day. It is insanely ridiculous. Every commercial, every building, every television show, every movie, every book, it is you're being influenced. I don't know if I said it in this group or maybe I said it on Wednesday night. But there's a there's a quote, it's about 100 years old now. I can't remember off the top of my head who said it. But it, it, it's saying how the poets of our society are really the politicians of tomorrow. The poets of our society are greater than the ones who write the laws of our society. Why? Because they're the ones that influence you. Every, here, here's the thing. Everything has an agenda now. We need to be aware of that. You need to guard the influence. For, for you as an individual. For your, for your marriage. For your kids. For the church. Because, I mean, I mean, how much of what I said today is completely countercultural? Oh, like all of it. So we guard the influence. We guard our thoughts. It's incredibly important we think biblically and truthfully about all these things. Remember, it's like staying on the path. I said, man, that's pretty narrow-minded, Pastor. Well, yeah, Jesus said, I'm the narrow gate. There's only one God. There's not many. There's only one way to God. So you think biblically and truthfully. And here's the thing. Here's, here's what I've been thinking about for the last month. Of how many things that because we learned it as a child, we even learned it in a church setting, we learned it in a religious setting, we think is something biblical, but the Bible says nothing about it. I can give you so many examples. We're not going there, that's not my intention. Think biblically and truthfully. That means you need to know your Bible. Front and back. Back and back. Think truthfully. And you, you guard by seeking faithfulness. Here's the thing. I'm, I'm not here to beat us up. I'm here to point us to Jesus. Faithfulness is hard. Faithfulness in marriage is hard. Faithfulness to the Lord is hard. We, we, we sing a song, right, that our hearts are prone to wonder, Lord, I fear it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take us to the seal of the Lord that courts me. We are prone towards faithlessness. Not faithfulness. Praise God. Praise God that in the midst of our faithlessness, we have a faithful one. I'm turning to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. Because you go, well, you know, I, I hear what you're saying about marriage, but Man, there are things that I've done. Or there are things that I regret. There are things we've all done. And there are all things we all regret. We need to understand that the grace of God is such that 
in confession and repentance, we can come in His love and grace. 2 Timothy 2, verse 11 says this, The same is trustworthy, for if we have died with Him, we will also live with Him. If we endure, we will also reign with Him. If we deny Him, He will also deny us. So check this. If we are faithless, there are times when I'm faithless. He remains faithful, for He cannot deny Himself. This is, is to me, this sounds like being married to God. When I read this, I see, I see the vows that we make with the Lord. I, I, I stared at the bride and groom last night. I say, how this works is you die to yourself, and you die to yourself. And we say, from two, it becomes one. Right? It's no longer bride and groom. It's just us. Listen to these words here. If we die with him, we live with him. How do we come to know the Lord? How does anybody come to the Lord? We, in our sin, we confess, we repent, we turn to the Lord, and we die to ourselves. And we say, God, my old life is gone. I want a new life with you. And what does it say here? If we die with him, <laughs> we gain life. We live with him. We live with him. Jim Elliot, he is the fool who gives what he cannot keep. To gain that which you cannot lose. If we die with him, we will live with him. Verse 12. If we endure, we will reign with him. Right? It's this endurance to say, man, in faithless times, I want to keep running to Jesus for richer, for poor, in sickness and in death. God, I want you. And then check this. If we deny him, he will also deny us. That's, that's what sends people to hell. That they deny the Lord. And they trust in themselves. Or they just refuse the Lord altogether. Right? He's going to deny those who are denying him. And then verse 13, check this. This is the love that we have in Jesus. If we have given our lives to Jesus. If we're in a relationship with God. If we are faithless. Like Malachi. They're a mess. They're falling apart in so many ways. There's us. Man, I, I wish I could. I wish I could stand here and say I've got it together every day of my life, twenty four seven, every second of every day. But I don't. And my heart is pulled in different directions. And my devotion wanes. And I agree with come now fact. And I say prone to wonder. Lord, I fear. But in Christ, if we are faithless, He remains faithful. He is a covenant making, covenant keeping God. Here's why. For He cannot deny Himself. This is what's so important. Right? Is that marriage is a picture of the gospel. The gospel is a picture of marriage. And so the relationship we have in Christ is we've become one with the Lord through salvation, through the cross, only by grace and faith. And so he is identifying with us. He has stamped us. He has said that we are his. And he remains faithful. Why? Because he keeps his promises. He keeps his word. He is the faithful God always. Always. And so, he is worthy of us guarding our marriage. He is worthy of us guarding our time. He is worthy of anything you would ask from us. He is worthy. And so why? Why? Let me ask this. Why would we take Jesus? Would we take the Bible and meld it with something else? And make up a Tashla? Is it because it gets hard sometimes to follow God? We want to have an easy button. 
for the things of the Lord. There's no God like our God. Why would, why would we try to fit him into the world's system? Why would we try to be the public relations agent for God and give him a makeover? He doesn't need one. We're the ones that need makeover. We need made new. So listen, if you're here and you've never given your life to Christ, where else will you go? Who else gives you life? Who else is as good to you as the Lord promises to be good to you? You're here and you're, you're a follower, you're a believer, and you say, man, I, I, I haven't been doing what I should, do, should be doing. I've been veering off the path that the Lord has given me. And I, I need the help of the Lord to get back on biblical footing before something bad, really bad happens. We're going to have a song of response. This is an opportunity for you to respond to the Lord. Where he's working. I'm going to ask the musicians to come up. If you need to start a relationship with the Lord, you know, I want to encourage you to come forward. Myself, I'll be down here. Roz will be down here. We'd love to visit with you and help you understand this. We each, you, need, you need prayer. You, you look at your life and you're looking at way the, your faithfulness towards the Lord or faithfulness in other areas. I encourage you. Don't, don't delay in this. Jesus, thank you.